Well, yeah, starting this thing off, how would you explain what exactly it is that you do? You know, what's your work here in this life? Uh, I watched some of your previous videos and that was a very big general question you asked and I was unprepared watching it first time. So I thought about <laughs> what, what I do, who I am, and this is how I would answer. I am a big follower of Shiva, the first yogi. This has been generally how my life went. I found something valuable or a person that was valuable. This was uh, back in the day I found the Buddha, the Buddha's teachings. And I followed him like a puppy dog. Uh, someone gave a puppy food and that's it. It would be hooked. So similarly, like, similarly as I am. So I'm just a follower of Shiva, follower of the first yogi. And uh, that's a very general sense how I describe myself. A devotee of Shiva, you see awesome. behind me. Yes. That's interesting how you went from Buddhism into Shiva. I feel as though it's usually the other way around. People go from yoga to Buddhism, right? I don't know. That's just a general trend. So on that note, what was it about following Shiva and Shiva's lessons and his wisdom that the Buddha didn't quite do for you? The Buddha had lots of technical knowledge, how to meditate and very logical, but not as much energy as I wanted to. Or I didn't even know that there was such a thing as energy to begin with. Mm. When this presence came into my life, it's an energetic thing. It's an energy mm, experience and it was so overwhelming i couldn't turn away from it it's impossible so it's like you know you're thirsty and your people are handing you cu cups of water and you're drinking and this is satisfying you but then all of a sudden you get pushed into a waterfall it's a whole different world so now i'm just basking in the glory of the waterfall and enjoying my life so. interesting yeah so what was this energy how could you explain this energy that dawned upon you you know what what was this all about the energy how to scream describe it is the energy of power the throat mm. chakra mm -hmm. if you have any experience with this you can kind of understand what this is but in essence it's the throat throat chakra energy very powerful blue energy and you can feel it it can uh, it touches your body and it's a uh, it's a phenomenon it's an experience yeah I understand. Yeah. And would you say it's like the power to shape our reality through our voice? You know, the power to sort of mold how this whole thing goes for one's life, but it's all coming from our voice and how we use it? 100%. You said it. Mm. Yes. Sort of meta. That's what we're doing right now. <laughs> yes. But it also extends further than just podcasts, like literally in all parts of our life. I mean, just think about it right now, anybody listening, how often you use your voice. And imagine if you just didn't have a voice, how much power would be taken away from you, right? That's, I think, how one can realize how much power your voice has. Imagine if you were just mute right now, you couldn't talk, you would feel handicapped, literally. So on the other side of the polarity of the spectrum, think about how much power you get from knowing how to utilize your voice in all endeavors you can do whatever you want yeah true power and it's not power i feel as though that is um how we understand it colloquially and how to dictate people even though it can be used in that way but i feel as though it's um power to just uh yeah exercise a sort of sovereignty and freedom right would you say that's along the lines of what this power is yeah, that sums it up well. And also manifestation. This is a great yep. explanation what this is. Yeah, manifestation. That's the buzzword that a lot of people <laughs> are into. But it all stems from the voice, for sure. Yeah, man. Wow. Yeah. So how do we um, get in touch with this power, would you say? Like, what are the practices and modalities to be able to tap in and utilize it to our best benefit? <laughs> Uh, the best way to get in touch with this energy is by focusing your attention on Kailash. So uh, on my YouTube channel, there's a banner, a picture of Kailash. I was in Kailash. Kailash is a mountain in the northern Himalayas. It's in China now. Actually, it's in Tibet. And it's a huge source of power. If you print a picture of this or maybe put this as your wallpaper and just sit quietly, maybe take a shower beforehand, light an oil, light a candle and just sit and meditate or be aware of what this is, it exudes that energy even through the picture. 
it's wow. just much more than a mountain. It's beyond any religions or philosophies or beliefs. It's a energetic, alive presence. I've never heard that before. That's interesting. So you're saying like focus your intention, all of your will upon the specific region of the earth and it will almost grant you this power? Mm, I would say it slightly differently. I would say don't don't have any will, just receive. See, look mm. at a picture and see what happens to you. Just be open. Uh, I see. Like thy will be done. Yes. Wow, that's interesting, man. But you can attest that this is what it's all about. So, you know, focusing upon this region is what grants you your power. In many ways, largely, yes. That's absolutely true. Hmm. Wow. So what is, so is it as simple as just looking at a picture or envisioning what happened there? Like, uh, I'm really actually just genuinely curious, like how... What is this all about? Like, it can't, is it as simple as just looking at a picture? My mind's like, it's too good to be true, <laughs> you yeah. know? So let me expand a little bit more what this mountain is. Mm -hmm. So uh, extremely long time ago, there was a wise yogi living in the mountains and he stored his knowledge in an energy form in the mountain. So this mountain is like a mystical library. You can't read any books in there, but it's an energetic, exuberant thing. And how you access it is you have to drop the boundaries within yourself. So the more boundaries you have to protect yourself and layers that you have, it prevents you from receiving the external stimulus. It prevents you from receiving energy from outside. So as you begin, as you become meditative and as you begin to meditate, those barriers, those walls, those fears drop and more sensitive you are to life. So it's not only essentially about this mountain. It's about all of life, how receptive you are to life, how sensitive you are to life. Mm -hmm. You just let it work through you, you know, just naturally grant you this power in the expression of your form is what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Okay. So how would you say your life has changed since you've tapped into this power? You know, the expression that we see as Shiva, like well, what is different before and after, you know, how would you explain the differences in that? Well, tangibly speaking, I created a YouTube channel in 2023. My first video was in March. So it's a little bit over a year now. And I have 5,000 subscribers. I'm able to make a substantial income from me making YouTube videos and offering my services to others. But not only that, personally, experientially, more sensitivity is gained, more awareness to life more perspective, more communication power and self-expression, less fear and hesitation, and more confidence over myself, a kind of grounding and self-assurity, securedness. Yeah, the benefits are many. many. Mm. Sounds like power to me. <laughs> Empowerment. Empowerment, yes. So... How would you describe who Shiva is or what this power of Shiva is? Maybe to somebody that has no clue, what is Shiva all about? <laughs> uh, the story goes that something like 70 to 80,000 years ago, this might be a little bit too overwhelming for some people hearing this, but that's the, that's the lore, that's the story. 70 to 80,000 years ago, there was a man living in the Himalayas. He was very weird looking. He had... Uh, tiger skin wrapped around himself, sometimes an elephant skin for warmth. Uh, he would go to their cremation ground and rub himself full of the decayed people's ashes. Uh, he would be in wild states of intoxication. Nobody understood who he was. But sometimes, occasionally, he would just sit on a rock peacefully, close his eyes, and not move a single muscle. And this didn't happen for a few hours or days even, or even weeks. Sometimes it carried on for months. So naturally, a huge crowd gathered just to see that man. He's passed beyond all measures of what a human being can do. And the only way they could tell he was alive was tears were shed from his face. He would be crying, tears of ecstasy. So that's who Shiva was. It's said that Shiva isn't a human being or wasn't a human being. He was an extraterrestrial that came. He was, he was a blue form and he took on a human form to kind of blend in and socialize. But his friends were called the Ganas. He, they were distorted beings. They were said to have limbs without bones and made all sorts of weird sounds. This was a mystical man. 
And so continuing on the story after this whole crowd gathered, he wouldn't, he wasn't doing anything and people had things to do. So most of them left only seven people remained. And these seven people, they stayed for a very long time around him, waiting for him to open his eyes and to glance upon them. And one day that's exactly what he did. So Shiva opened his eyes out of his meditation. And he saw that there was these seven human beings so receptive, so ready for his knowledge. And he dispensed the science of yoga. He taught them everything. Once he taught them everything, he said, okay, now you go. You go share this with the humanity. So one of the seven sages stood with him in the northern plains of the Himalayas. One went, one went south to the Himalayan region or South Himalayas. One went into actually India, which we call Augustia Muni. One in, went into Africa. One went to the South, south Asia and, um, and also South America. So they all spread across the world. And the remnants of Shiva's energy are present in many places around the world. Uh, you can see this easily by the worship of the snake that's present in virtually every part of the planet. And the most, um, the largest example is in Mexico. There is this temple that uh, it's like built as a pyramid with steps on each side. So if you become aware and you attune yourself to this, to this energy, it's just screaming with Shiva's energy. So these beings spread the teachings and the knowledge of his, his science, the science of yoga, the science of the body and the science of the mind, how to transcend human limitations and go towards ultimate liberation. And the being that did the most contribution out of these seven human beings was Agastya Muni, who taught human beings in uh, India. And he walked all across the Indian subcontinent and established yoga centers and established consecrated forms and temples where still you can go and you can still benefit from. So that's why India is the way it is today. That's why it's a hub for spiritual knowledge and growth. And uh, essentially, it's all as a result of Shiva, which you can see a representation behind me. Mm. Wow. So what happened to the other six disciples of Shiva? They just weren't as powerful. They couldn't get the message across to the people. Something along those lines. Yeah, well, because the Indian subcontinent is so protected, well protected. It has the, the mountain ranges in the north and the mm. Indian Ocean surrounding the entire mm, continent. It is very safe from invasions. So not many invasions occurred in India. So naturally, as your safety increases, your kind of desire to protect yourself and exploration of the universe kind of springs forth naturally. Most of the planet was uh, riddled with fear and people conquering you every single chance you get. And yeah. you build for something for a few hundred years or a thousand years and then you get conquered. So that that was a big mess. So essentially, yes, the most powerful being went to South India because that was the most ripe land for spiritual growth and evolution. And everywhere else that uh, these these yogis went, so maybe they weren't so powerful, but uh, it all kind of got destroyed very quickly. Mm. Yeah. Would you say the other religions of the world are... Um, just kind of like crude and distorted remnants of the bestowal of Shiva? That is correct. That's an accurate statement. I would uh, wholeheartedly believe that. I believe that at least, yes. Yes, but it all comes from Shiva. It all comes from this great being 80,000 years ago. Yes. Yeah. If only people knew that. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because you got Christians call it uh, the heathenism, you know, blasphemy. It's uh, Satanism. It's like, if you only really knew where all this came from. <laughs> uh, the irony, man. Yeah. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah, so like the story of, uh, we'll say, like the, the Israelites and Moses, you, you think that's like remnants of the one of the disciples? I know the timeline might be a little off, you know, <laughs> a few 10,000 years, but ultimately you think that the story of the Bible comes from Shiva in one way or the other? Uh, no, I don't think it's, it comes from the, the story of Shiva, but uh, in essence, Shiva is known as a source of yoga. It's He's a very source of yoga and spirituality. So in some sense, everybody has been touched by the source. You know, it's like the source of a uh, waterfall travels and it all ends up in the ocean. So the ocean is touched by wherever the water is coming from. Yeah. But uh, I, in essence, I also don't doubt or believe strongly that Jesus was... Um, uh, a monk, or we could say uh, a yogi. And he also benefited from the science of yoga in India. The three wise men that came to visit him, most likely they were from India. And they took him away and they took him to India, most likely, and taught him meditation, and taught him all these uh, spiritual things. And then he came back and he did all this work. So it's a little bit late for the uh, the story of the Bible um, connecting to Shiva's time. So, But it's still 
in essence it's touched by this by this great being yeah everything you're saying is touched by the great being in one way or the other like all roads lead to the dharma of shiva right all rivers lead to the the water of shiva and shiva's grace i guess why i was asking is because maybe the story and i'm just I'm just BSing here. Maybe the story of the Bible is more of like a, a wider river. It's more of like a, it connects a little bit deeper to the story of Shiva and all of these other religions. And plus, it's, it's one of the oldest. I mean, like the Old Testament and the Israelites, like maybe in one way or the other, they were connected and they were a closer tributary, you could say, to the river of Shiva. And that's why I was asking is like, it has to, like, even though everything does touch it, maybe this story somehow in one way or the other that probably can't explain right now, touches it in a more direct way you know what i'm getting at mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah i don't know i mean i don't think anyone really has the answer because we have a lack of records but if everything relates and this is such a powerful story for humanity for some reason and it resonates there has to be some kind of inclination to um shiva in there and whoever spread it to that region of the world i don't know the name of the saint who did so but it I don't know. There's got to be some dots that can be connected in one way or the other. But at the end of the day, who knows? And it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's just a story. Um, yeah. So this power of Shiva consciousness is available for all of us. We all can tap into this. We all can access this energy that you have found. Yes, you can. It's available to all of us. Absolutely. I mean, it's all through meditation would you say like intentional meditation toward the uh, kailash um yes meditation in essence you have to be uh, available to this grace make yourself available it'll uh-huh. come to you yeah so in essence get out of your own way and let it work through you <laughs> yes yeah i feel that man yeah i mean some call it the higher self sadguru the holy spirit intuition but I feel as though it's the same energy. It's the same essence. You just got to let it work through you and let go of control, it seems a little bit, or at least your idea of control. And then let the Holy Spirit take you over, man. And that's it. That's the truth. It's uh, just about getting out of your own way. Would you say that is the, uh, that is the way to actually let this have access to you per se is just, just, let go of your own individualistic, egotistical will, right? And kind of recognize there's a greater power that you have access to if you want it. So is that the essence, like surrender? You said it. Those are the exact words. <laughs> I think I'm explaining myself a little too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I think at the end of the day, it all has to do with surrender in one way or the other, whether you want to call it to Shiva, to Kailash, to Jesus, uh, to Yahweh, Hashem, Muhammad, Allah, God. There's many different names, the infinite. But I think it all has to do with just surrender, man. Surrender your egotistical will of wanting of hedonism or wanting power or wanting fame or yada yada. Just surrender that to a power that's way greater than you could ever imagine. Have a little faith that that is possible, first of all. And then with that faith, find a natural surrender and devotion to that power. And that'll lead the way. That'll lead the way through all endeavors. That's the thing, too. Is that this, like, this power that we're talking about here, um, it's relevant through just about everything, if not everything that happens to us or for us in our life, you know? Like, do you feel as though that this power is... Um, something that is with you all the time no matter what not even just in terms of your creative capacities but you know just like when you're doing the dishes or you're you're dealing with people like this power is something that you live with you know you live as yes i would say the power or the consciousness of the universe is ever present it's within you right now it's without you it's in the dishes it's in the dishwasher you're just becoming aware of it and that's it your life will change yeah it's that simple yeah oh man it's quite miraculous too you know to actually have this bestowed and to to truly feel this and not have it just be um 
something that people are talking about on the internet, like to actually feel this in one's life, oh, excuse me, is um, truly miraculous, you know, to live with this. And then once you feel it, you don't go back. I feel at least like once you know that this is accessible, um, you may get caught in ignorance here and there. You know, we're all human. We're all faulty. But at the end of the day, so once you tap into it yourself, uh, there's no going back. Once you take the red pill, you don't go back into the matrix the same way. <laughs> you know yeah to me it's like a sense of invulnerability right a sense of nothing can really harm me it's like a suit of armor to the goings on of the world to be in the world and not of it right do you feel that like uh you have this sense of you can conquer anything and not conquer like Genghis Khan or Alexander the Great but you can conquer all the turmoil and suffering that life yields Yes, absolutely. Um, when you connect with God and the grace of God, challenges become, or obstacles become challenges and challenges are fun. Nothing <laughs> that you can't do. Yeah. Almost like you can find a little bit of play with your pain. I know that sounds a little masochistic, but you just know how to en enjoy it and go with the flow rather than against it. Yes, correct. Yeah, I feel that, man. Go with the flow. Swami Muktananda. I say this a lot, but he has a saying, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. So I think that's the essence of it, man. <laughs> Learning how to surf with the waves of our life. Mm -hmm. It's the essence of the Tao too. You're either with it or against it. It's this motion, right? It's, it's kinetic motion. It's Shakti. Shiva and Shakti, right? Is that the essence of Shakti? Like the marriage of Shiva and Shakti, it's that like from this ultimate potential, ultimate peace, this ultimate, from this God energy, the energy that comes forth from it, this kinetic energy from the ultimate potential of Shiva is this beautiful dance, this beautiful marriage that you just find yourself intermingled between. Yes, it is a dance. Shiva and Shakti in essence is a dance. That's correct. Mm -hmm. The dance. The dance of the Tao. Beautiful, man. <laughs> yeah well um i don't even know what to say i don't even know what to ask from here <laughs> i feel like we've exhausted a lot <laughs> um now where does this all come from for you to want to get this out to the world and speak upon this energy and this power is this just natural like you kind of want to give back a little bit like you've had this realization to change your life this empowerment um do you feel as though you just kind of you kind of have to spread the word a little bit? And that's correct. Yes, I have to give back. It's mm. time to do so. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I feel you on that. Yeah. But why? You know, just like, is there something that just tugs? Is there like a pull toward God? Like you kind of, because you don't have to, right? I can, I can imagine like having this realization, I feel like you don't have to. You can just kind of keep it all to yourself and just kind of go along with the stuff of your life but yet we here we are on camera with a microphone talking about it trying to spread the good word um do you just feel as though there's an obligation from shiva to be uh, i was gonna say evangelical about it but that has a negative connotation but you know what i'm getting at yes yes i do yeah yeah it's kind of like when you've totally fulfilled yourself and there's an exuberance of energy it naturally has to come out it feels good to come out so, that's it i do this yeah it feels good right it's like it's a win-win situation that's what i feel you know you help yourself and then you help yourself <laughs> it's that simple yes yeah yeah man because it's, it's like uh when once you start to feel and see the self in others you can't help but help <laughs> you can't help mm. or try to help i mean at the end of the day we we help ourselves that's the thing too we can only do so much and no one likes anyone to be too evangelical but i feel as though personally life becomes a sort of offering it's like just throwing it out there like do you feel as though um you are you are like an offering as the expression that we see now like you're just kind of you're throwing it out there your guidance is out there for people if they truly want it and if they don't well no strings attached you said it again perfectly yes this is an offering <laughs> 
<laughs> it's an offering. Mm. You think that's the path of all of the sages in one way or the other? Your life, your life story becomes an offering for others to tap into? Uh, yes. Um, I'm reminded of the story of Shiva, the, the first yogi, after he taught the seven sages, he said, before you go, give me an offering. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we have nothing. What can we offer you? You're so majestic. So you know everything that we know, plus much more. What can we offer? No, you have to, you have to give an offering. He wanted them to give an offering so that they leave with a state of mind of offering. That's the best way to present yourself in the world. You have to offer something. Be of service. Wonderful. Yep. Service. Feel that. Yeah, to be of service. An offering that um, I feel, and not that I do it for this reason, not that anybody does it for this reason, but it transcends one's life, one's life and death, like something that you leave here. It's an offering that you leave for future generations, you know? You leave for everyone here and you leave for future generations. And I feel as though that is the most honorable and noble pursuit, not that it's a pursuit, but for lack of a better word, noble pursuit that we could yield for ourselves in the human incarnation is to give back a little, but also when you give back, it um, reverberates through the generations, you know, and it doesn't have to be grandiose like Shiva, you know, I think it's just like you could be a good father or mother or brother or sister, just a good person. And then when you're gone, people tell stories about, oh, that that Gary guy, you know, he yada, yada, yada. He was a good person or, you know, but you don't do it for that. It's just like naturally, I think when you tap into this empowerment, you just it just flows through you and you become that offering. And I hope that doesn't sound arrogant or grand, grandiose in some kind of way coming from me. But I think that's just the fact of the matter. It's like naturally you just become this offering because there's no other way. Like there's no other alternative to live, I feel. You know, there's no other alternative but to give back. That's the purest thing, like the essence of like sacrifice and offering yourself for humanity. It just feels good. Like you said, like that is the essence of like feeling good, I feel. It's just like, how can I not, you know? Do you feel that like, how can you not? It would actually cause you more suffering if you did not offer this stuff online and to the people around you? I wouldn't say it uh, would cause me suffering. Um, maybe I can go into the woods or live in some cave and be also content. But I'm living in the world. This is what I want to, to do. And it's okay also if you're out there and you're not contributing anything. Maybe it's time for you to receive. You need to receive before you give. You need to fill your own cup before you have something to give to others. So mm. there's an ebb, of, ebb and flow of life. Yeah, ebb and flow. That's true. Yeah, don't just because we are the offering, don't be afraid to accept the offering of the world and offering of others. Very true. It is the dance as we spoke of before. Yeah, because that could cause actually more suffering if you find yourself giving out too much and sacrificing too much for the greater good per se. <laughs> you could suffer yourself and thus in turn that is counterintuitive to actually being the offering. So yes, it is this dance. It is this beautiful dance of um, accepting what you need and then offering from that um, from that, whatever you have been given in the grace of God. Yeah. Very well said, man. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, go ahead. Yes. I feel obligated also to speak about, uh, this man here, Sadhguru. I'm mm. just wondering if you know anything about him or. Oh yeah. For sure. Yeah, I actually meant to ask you about him. Um, do you have anything you want to start off though? I mean, what do you want to say about him? So this is the man that introduced me to Shiva. And uh, I feel obligated to talk about him also because he's a great being, great man. And he's walking the planet today. You can go to his YouTube channel and subscribe, which is amazing. You know, yes. Many thousands of years ago, this wouldn't be a possibility, meaning you would have to go and find a, a master in a cave or some obscure place but he's here on youtube teaching us teaching us all yep and that's the beauty of our times is we have these beings we have these great beings in our pockets 
isn't that so wonderful? <laughs> we take it for granted, right? Because you can just, I could go on right now, see him on a podcast and be like, oh, he's just another guest. But no, he's not just another guest. <laughs> he's a great being, a saint and a sage that is living amongst us that you can tap into. And there's many other saints and sages for sure. But the fact that we have Sadhguru with us right now is very special. And I imagine you revere him a lot more than I do and have a more uh, of a special relationship, but I revere him very much so as well. Um, so yeah, the times that we're in, it's like they can either make you or break you, you know? And uh, if you know how to tap into the right people that have the right energy, they can definitely guide the way for you to be actually like Sadhguru, you know, not necessarily um, like him in his, in his likeness, but um, follow in his footsteps, you know, to follow him as Jesus would say. And that is quite wonderful, man. Yeah. So what is it about Sadhguru that appealed to you? You know, why is his energy and his teachings and wisdom very special for you? Initially, he appealed to me because he said many spiritual things that uh, actually initially I didn't agree with or that wasn't what I was taught, but I persisted. And uh, one day, spontaneously, I received uh, an advertisement saying that he's coming to Toronto, you know, the place that I live, and he's doing a program and you get to see him. And I ignored that for some time, but then after a while, I realized, okay, this I need to do this. It, uh, it was pulling me towards that, and I thought it was a great opportunity to maybe potentially see an enlightened man. So I did, and the first day that I saw him in 2019 in November, he walked on stage, and I saw the light of God within him shining wow. outwardly. Uh, now, that was the end of my doubt. I thought that this is the wow. man that I'm going to pay attention to for the rest of my life. He obviously has the results, he, a fully enlightened being. That's exactly what I want whatever he had to tell me, there was no more logical thought. Is this right? Is this wrong? Do I doubt this? Do I not doubt this? Mm. Because the results were shown. Interesting. Yeah. Now, do you feel that this Shiva energy is something that is like a chain link from person to person and it is bestowed from great beings like Sadhguru? As in, it's like he can, you don't need anybody specifically, but if you do have a special being in your life, it can um, exponentially increase, what's the word I'm looking for? It can just make it a lot easier, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You know, like that's the, that's the way that it's done. Like Dharma just like transfers from one person to the other. That's correct. In meditation or in spirituality, there's a practice called Tumo, I believe it's what it's called. It's when you generate heat within yourself. This is good for yogis that are living in the Himalayan mountains to, to get the solar plexus fire up. If you don't have a fire, ex external fire, it could save your life, but also advanced practice. Or simultaneously, you can bring a lighter and light some piece of logs and have an external fire. So the point is that you can generate your own fire, but it's extremely very difficult to do. It's a really no need. Mm. There's lots of external fires and Sadhguru is like that, an external fire. Ah, yeah. It's a good metaphor. Yeah. It's so much easier to make a fire when you already have a fire. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's, uh, that's so succinct. Yes. Wow. And it's funny because Sadhguru is very unique in where he goes on all of these popular podcasts, non-spiritual podcasts per se, and he speaks to these regular people. And I think a lot of the stuff that he says goes over people's heads. You know, like they're just not in the right frame. It's like he has this fire, but there's nothing flammable in the other person. I find that interesting and um, quite entertaining, actually. Like he was on Theo Vaughn's podcast the other day. And, you know, Theo Vaughn's a comedian. And I think just a lot of the stuff that he was saying was just kind of going, Whoo, you know, so that's what's very interesting about Sadhguru. But if you if you are very attuned to the Dharma, he makes so much sense. Um, so, yeah, in that regard, do you find that interesting about him is how he goes on to these, uh, the, the normie, <laughs> for lack of a better word, the, norm, the normie podcast to try to explain the Dharma to these people? Yeah, some people don't like that. They think that uh, Guru is supposed to be above that. He shouldn't go on podcasts, but I I would do the same thing. Yeah. They're human beings after all, and if somebody has exactly. an audience, and if you have a right message, you should definitely speak. Uh, so I like it. I agree with it. I think so too. Yeah. I just think also I can agree with the other people that would um, detest that because I think in order to transfer the Dharma, you could say the transfer of wisdom to a certain extent, the other person has to be open for it. And if they're not open, the conversation could get stagnant. 
right? It's like, so I can see that point of view of why people would detest it, but I'm on your point of view where it's just like, as long as he's getting the word out, he has this popularity and the fact that you can tap into so many people so quickly, it's like, why not? You know, but I yes. can see, I can see why. Cause like I listen to these and some of them are just painful. I'm like, oh, they don't understand what he's saying. I'm like, oh, if they, if only, <laughs> but still it's not Sagru's fault. He's doing the best that he can. The most important part of it is like, one has to be open to the Dharma. You have to be genuinely open and curious and kind of vulnerable to Sadhguru. Cause I imagine, I can just see it in the videos too, where like people get like nervous. I think it's like, you know, he's, he's so calm. And just like you said, the God's presence is there and I can see people clamp up. They can't be the character that they always were on the podcast. So yeah, it's interesting to see that, you know, it's interesting to see that. I think if, um, I don't know, he's an interesting character. That's for sure. We take him for granted. We take him for, well, I don't take him for granted. I know you don't take him for granted, but I think, I think the world takes him for granted in what we have because nobody else is doing that. Like, do you know anybody else that is, that is so attuned to him? You know, like you said, walking God's grace, the light of God that goes on all of these podcasts, like Theo Vaughn, Joe Rogan, and many, many other popular people's podcasts to just outwardly, openly spread the Dharma in the way that he does. I, I can't think of anybody. No, I, I can't think of anybody either. He's yeah. unique. <laughs> very unique maybe you in the future <laughs> maybe you'll get there <laughs> let's hope we're on this podcast that's all that matters at this point yes yeah 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 man but i think the point of the story here is what we're saying is one just has to be open enough to get god's grace you know we have to get out of our own way as we started in the beginning um the offering is there for beings like Sadhguru and many other sages of the past you just got to be open you got to you just have to be like, be a conducive flow. You know, they have to open the gates. You have to let the wood be flammable for the, for the fire to light within you. You know, you have to build that kind of like foundation within yourself for the light and the fire to ignite. Mm. Now, how would you say we even are get open? You know, like where is this, what is this, um, opportunity start for all of us would you say you know like because i feel as though that's the hardest part is being able to be open and curious enough on really what Sadhguru or any of the other sages are saying so where does this path start for all of us well let's not start from the start because you've started i'm sure most people have already started it's yeah. uh how to how can you continuously walk on this path how can you finish it how can you walk faster avoid the obstacles um, the easiest answer, I guess, is there are spiritual tools for you to help you. Like, for example, I'm wearing one, these spiritual beads that I have sourced in the Himalayas. There's a spiritual tool for your spiritual growth. You can invest in tools. You can buy tools. That's one way of becoming open. You can watch Sadhguru's videos. That's also a fantastic way to get opened. Yeah, I know what you're saying, man, but I feel as though one is already open at that point. You know what I'm getting at? Like, even though we might not be open, open, I feel as though if you're already interested in Sadhguru's videos or you bought the tools, there's, there's something that's, you know, pure in itself open. So what about like the, like getting the glimpse into curiosity? Like, do you think that is something, I don't know, like, I know it's nothing that we can do. It's all God's grace, but like, how can we allow ourselves to even have an open enough mind to be able to see that this is a possibility you know where does that all come from the shortcut to this path uh, the question that you're asking is to drop your conclusions if you could drop all of your conclusions today right now you would instantly be enlightened or become enlightened hmm. conclusions you know? conclusions okay <laughs> i'm not I don't quite understand. You drop your conclusions on how the world should be in control, I think, as we spoke of a little bit before. So drop the story, the narrative of who you are, how the world should be, and just, yeah, just let that all go. That's a starting point. You know, a child is naturally enlightened. You look at a child, he has no conclusions. His mind isn't wow. working in that way. Mm. He's just... Yeah. Receptive, taking it all in. I see. Uh-huh. Yeah. Unless you become like children, 
and you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. A wise yes. man once said. I see. Yeah. So it's a return to innocence. Do you think that's what our our turmoil, our suffering brings us to? Like a point of exhaustion so that we have to let go and um, return and remember this childlike innocence where we all came from? Yes, uh, to add to that, you know, when you grow out of your childhood state, naturally you build a mind and it's essential for your survival. But the mind's tool becomes so overactive, so hyper, so you don't know how to drop it. You don't know how to stop using it. So the mind is a conclusion factory. For example, you watch this video, you see me. I'm sure you've made 5, 10, 15 conclusions already in my mind. <laughs> yeah. Most of them are inaccurate. Actually, yeah. all of them are inaccurate. Conclusions don't serve you except for the survival survival situation. Okay, it's fair to make conclusions. But if you want to perceive the ultimate reality, conclusions is what blocks you from perception, direct perception. Yeah. You want to stop concluding things. Oh, there's a tree, there's an apple, there's a fireplace. No, no, you just let it all in. What is this? When you do that, when you open your eyes like a child, it's all there. Everything is mm. there. You don't need a teacher, actually. Yeah. Now, is that similarly what the Buddha talks about with clinging and attachments, its conclusions? Yeah, he talked about, uh, well, yes, the mental formations that come into your mind, attaching yourself to that, attaching yourself to the thoughts. You have to let everything go. He was a big proponent of letting things go. Yes, you have to let your thinking go, let your beliefs go, let your imagination go, let your firm identity go your firm conclusions, everything. It all has to drop away for you to become nothing. Yep, to become nothing. That's the last thing the ego wants, though, to become nothing. What? But yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the path. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's really freedom. It just comes down to that. And it's not even like becoming nothing. I feel as though it's like realizing the nothingness that already is or isn't right it's not becoming anything it's just for that's just how we structure our sentences here but yeah it's like just remembering the nothingness the the void that is already present and that is freedom yeah it might not seem like it to the mind and to anyone that has no idea what we're talking about even though i imagine anyone listening right now knows what we're talking about to some extent but just think to the mind to the ego mind nothing that is death that is premature death but yes exactly it is ego death. And that is the way, man. It is the way. Is Now, uh, yeah, I mean, that may sound scary or daunting, right? Now, how would you describe, uh, for lack of a better word, the incentive to the nothingness, you know? is Why would anyone even want to pursue this path in the first place? That seems a little scary, you know? Like, how would you, how would you sell the path, <laughs> you know? To sell the path is basically at the other end is freedom from suffering. Mm. Are you tired of suffering out there? Well, you got to start walking. There, there's an end to it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yep. That's simple. <laughs> Are you tired of suffering yet? Well, not yet. All right. Keep on going on the hamster wheel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's that simple, man. Yeah, we get to a point of of exhaustion of our suffering and in that way i like to say suffering is grace or as ramdas says suffering becomes grace you start to see why you suffered in so so many different ways in the past and what it really was past the um past the appearance of your suffering or past the feeling of your suffering in the moment one can come to find it's it was all meant to be per se maybe that might be a platitude but it is it's all meant to be and it's all for us in one way or the other Truly, it's all God's grace. And hallelujah to that. It's all God's grace, you know? Hmm. Do you feel as though that is the point, if there is a point, of this human incarnation is God realization? Like all roads lead to God realization? I would say so, yes. All roads inevitably lead to this. Uh, suffering is painful. It's not pleasant and... Ultimately, the only way to resolve that is to become liberated. So inevitably, everybody turns towards us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, inevitably. Exactly. Sooner or later. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, might seem like uh, it's going to take a little bit of time <laughs> on the road we're on. But I think not as much time as um, not as much time as we. Th- how do I put this? You know, it might seem like the world is in a dark place. It's Kali Yuga, and uh, we are caught in the darkness. But I think there's something going on in the zeitgeist where we're all getting the message. We're all reaching that point of exhaustion of saying, "Hey, man, there's got to be another way." And uh, I think it's also it's due to the internet. It's due that we ha- it's due to that we have the guidance of people like you and Sadhguru and Shiva and the Vedas and the Upanishads, right? It's the fact that this point of exhaustion is being reached, but we have guidance out of the exhaustion at this point. The internet is a wonderful, wonderful tool that is uh, at the disposal for all of us to be able to see this and have the fire lit within all of us. So, yeah, there's something going on. I guess the point of my story is there's, there's something going on right now. And it may seem a little dark, it may seem a little bleak, but I think that the revolution will not be televised as we speak. And uh, yeah, it's all because of people like you. So truly, this is an honor to have you on here. Um, people that are firm in this understanding and this realization that can guide the way and light the fire within all. Truly, it's um, it's an honor. And it's very noble that you're doing this, man. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we can probably start to wrap this up on that note. It might be a good note to wrap this up. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to say, though? No, I think we've pretty much uh, exhausted the the main content. Uh, I appreciate of you inviting me on, and I got a chance to share these things. For sure, Shiva. Yes, I appreciate you coming on here, sharing your time, effort, and wisdom. I can tell you are very firm, like I said, in your understanding, very wise, very stoic in this. So keep up the good work, and I wish you all Thank the best, my much. friend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peace and love. Peace and love to you, and peace and love to the listener. Yes. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>